My name is Alan Levinson, and I'm very pleased uh, to introduce uh, the first round table, uh, which is co-sponsored by the SEC Historical Society and the Securities Exchange Commission. Uh, we're particularly pleased uh, for several reasons. One, we believe that we have selected one of the unique, most important studies ever conducted by the Commission, and that was the 1963, I should say 61 to 63, special study of the securities markets. We're also pleased to have the key people who made such a significant contribution to the federal securities laws, not only at that time, but through their foresight through the current date. And that's your current panelists, who are going to be introduced by the co-moderators uh, shortly. A special thank you for organizational purposes to Jack Katz of the SEC, who literally uh, was a yeoman type person in making the necessary arrangements here. But it really couldn't have been done without one member of our Oral Histories Committee, and that was David Silver. So a special thanks to David. Uh, we're going to have two other uh, speakers. Uh, the next speaker is Dave Ruda, who's chairman of the SEC Historical Society, as well as former chairman of the SEC. And then the SEC chairman, Harvey Pitt. I might say that talking about oral histories, uh, great commendation is deserved by the current commission, commissioners, chairman, and staff for the exceptional performance resulting from the September 11th situation. And I'm sure. Years from today, somebody else is going to be standing here, and what the oral history will be is a round table on the SEC and September 11th. At this point, I'm very pleased to turn our program over for a special welcome to Dave Ruda. Dave? Chairman Pitt. Commissioners, members of the Securities and Exchange Commission staff, members of the Securities and Exchange Commission Historical Society, roundtable participants and, and friends. Uh, as chairman of the society, it is my pleasure to welcome all of you to the Historical Society's first oral histories program, the roundtable on the 1963 special study. The Historical Society was created in 1999 for the purpose of preserving the history of the Commission, to sponsor research and educational programs about the SEC, and to enhance understanding of the U.S. and the world's capital markets. This roundtable is the Society's first public program. Its second will be an SEC major issues conference, Securities Regulation in the Global International Economy, to be held in Washington, D.C. on November 14 and 15 this year. Our society is still growing, and we thank all of you for your interest and support, and we hope that you will attend our program in November. I could not make these remarks without offering my personal thanks to Harvey Pitt and Paul Gonson for their hard work and perseverance in creating the society. Harvey served as president of the society before becoming chairman of the commission. Paul was the initial SEC spark plug, served as secretary treasurer of the society 
uh, and is now president uh, of the society. And on an intensely personal note, I want to acknowledge my enormous debt to Milton Cohen, who's here today. I, I worked uh, closely with Milton in Chicago for many years, and for five years was of counsel of uh, his law firm. And one of my uh, great endeavors and, uh, and pleasures was to uh, be one of the editors on his famous Truth and Securities article. And for those of you who are historically minded, you will find a footnote in that article acknowledging that work. Uh, Milton, you educated me about the markets. You showed me the power of an unmatched, incisive, and creative intellect. And you inspired me to believe in the importance of the SEC's mission. And I thank you. Uh, it's my, my great pleasure to uh, uh, introduce to you the current chairman of the Securities and Ex Exchange Commission, Harvey Pitt. Uh, I don't believe he needs any introduction in this in this group, but I can say that it has been my pleasure uh, over many endeavors over past years to work with Harvey, and I couldn't have been more pleased that he was chairman of the commission at the time of the awful events in September. Um, my own tenure as chairman started with the a historic event of October 19th, 1987, and I sympathized with what Harvey was doing as the head of the commission at a time in which he was dealing with unprecedented events. And Harvey, as Alan indicated, uh, those of us watching from the outside have been enormously pleased and, and thankful for the work that you and the rest of the commission have done in these trying times. Harvey Pitt. Thank you, uh, Dave and Alan, and welcome to everyone. Uh, this is um, an important first for uh, both the SEC and the SEC Historical Society. And I think um, the fact that um, we have um, such leadership uh, in the organization with David Ruder and Alan Levinson um, and uh, all of the participants that you're about to hear from um, shows why this is such an important area and why the work of the SEC Historical Society is um, so very important. Uh, I would like to say that um, uh, I uh, appreciate all the kind remarks about the Commission's performance. Um, I think when you have the opportunity uh, to serve with um, wonderful people like Ike Hunt and Laura Unger, and fabulous staff, um, uh, too numerous to name, but all of whom uh, rise to um, uh, great heights uh, following in the traditions of the Commission that we'll hear a little bit about. It's easy for things to um, appear to go uh, reasonably well in a time of turmoil. On the other hand, I think we all believe that on-the-job training is not what it's cracked up to be. Um, Oral histories um, are important, uh, I suppose, because the old saw is if we don't learn uh, from history, we're doomed to repeat it. I'm not sure if that would be so um, uh, terrible, uh, given the uh, special study and what it did. Uh, I think this is, in particular, a unique opportunity for our staff uh, and for the commission. Um, I have to say I feel smarter uh, just being in the same room with what uh, Byron Woodside uh, called one of the uh, finest collections of talent he'd ever seen. Um, it sort of calls to mind uh, uh, former uh, President Kennedy's uh, great line when he was hosting a, a state dinner for um, U.S. Uh, Nobel laureates. I think he said, uh, this is the greatest collection of American brain power uh, to uh, convene for dinner since Thomas Jefferson ate alone. There's sort of a similar, a similar um, uh, kind of feeling about um, um, uh, the special study. The agency that we um, uh, are all somehow connected with has always been a special place. It has succeeded in attracting um, 
very talented and very uh, well-intended and hard-working uh, people. The um, special study was unique um, and still is. It's the only study the Commission ever produced that was called special, and it deserved to be. Um, it is and was very uh, special, and it catapulted the SEC um, to a level of significance um, in our country's uh, financial and economic history uh, that the Commission has uh, uh, tried to maintain ever since. Um, the study became front page news of the New York Times based on the um, uh, efforts that you're going to hear um, a lot about. It was a comprehensive um, look at market structure and in some senses, as I'm sure Annette will um, testify, um, the uh, development of markets and market structure is uh, somewhat like watching a soap opera. Almost 40 years later, you can still pick up the special study and it's still relevant. There are still wonderful things in there. So I'm delighted that we have so many uh, former uh, colleagues from the Commission um, and uh, so many people who worked on the study of whom I think we should um, uh, all be, uh, we should all be very proud. Um, uh, not by way of criticism, Milton, but um, uh, it is said that success um, has uh, many parents, uh, but failure is an orphan. And um, as uh, hard as it may have seemed back then when you all were working on the study with a very small group of people, since then the number of people who claim credit uh, for working on the special study is so large that I would have thought you could have done it in a much shorter period of time. Um, but uh, putting that to, to one side, I think there are two people um, who deserve special recognition in terms of the um, uh, efforts that produced the special study. The, the first was Bill Carey, um, who set a wonderful um, uh, standard uh, for uh, SEC chairman and who saw the need and the importance of the study. And the uh, second was Milton Cohn. I've known Milton for quite some time and um, everything you've heard about his intellectual prowess, um, his uh, dedication, his energy is all true, but possibly understated. So I think everyone um, owes um, Milton a, a great deal of thanks for producing an incredible work of lasting significance. With that, I'd like to turn to uh, two people who are no strangers to um, uh, the markets and uh, who've spent uh, careers dealing with the issues. Um, my very dear friend, Irv Pollock, um, uh, who has been a mentor and a friend and a, a wonderful example, and a good friend, Brandon Becker, who are going to uh, lead this roundtable in discussion. Thank you, Harvey. <coughs> Unfortunately, a few of the people who served on the special study are no longer with us, including Fred Morse, who was to have participated but who passed away a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so I would just ask everyone present to just observe a moment of silence in tribute to those who are no longer with us. things have been said about the director of the special study. And those of you who are in the back, he's the fourth man from my left sitting at the angle in the table there. I don't think anything you could say about Milton Cohn would give due credit for his practice, not only in the special study, but in his early years here in the commission, which he joined in 1935, where he served in the Corporation Finance Division initially and then in the very important Public Utilities Division. Uh, he then left uh, to go into private practice, and as uh, Chairman Pitt has said, uh, Bill Carey was smart enough to select him to do the special study, which started in about September of 1961. The legendary study which followed is a tribute to his leadership 
and to the leadership of Ralph Saul, who also was the associate director of that division, and to the people who sit on the panel today. They represent an unusual group of talented and able people who were able in a very short time to produce a really fabulous study. And as uh, Chairman Pitt has said, it is still relevant. I found it so when I was here at the Commission in the <coughs> Trading and Markets Division for many years. I just picked it up the other day to read it, and I suggest that a few people would pick up part five of the study and just read it. You will see many of your present problems, which were analyzed very, very critically and very ably in those days, and which indicated the solutions that had to be achieved in order to solve the problems. So to Milton Cohn, we owe a tremendous credit. After the special study, he was responsible for coming up with the ingenious solution of how options could be traded in an exchange market. He was responsible for suggesting the integration of the 33 and 34 acts, which the Commission has proceeded to implement since then. So if any gentleman who sits in this room today to whom we owe great credit, it is Milton Cohen. Also, <clears throat> sitting beside him is Ralph Saul, who also served in the Commission starting in around 1957. And then he went on to become associate director of the special study and is largely responsible for the administration and uh, collection of the uh, people who worked on the study and in administering the various tasks that they had in a manner that permitted the study to be finished by 1963. Uh, Ralph then came back and served as director of the Trading and Markets Division and then left the commission uh, and served as president of the American Stock Exchange and chairman and CEO of uh, the Cigna Corporation, and before that as chairman of the executive committee of First Boston. He also has served on very many boards and was responsible for the rescue operation of the Drexel Burnham catastrophe. Uh, so he has had a distinguished record in the field both as a corporate uh, governance person and in the legal side of the business. Uh, let me see. Gene Rockberg, who sits the second from me on the right, uh, also was at the commission in the late 1950s, where he served in the Corporation Finance Division. He then was picked to do a special study job, where he was in charge of over-the-counter market study and the underwriting study uh, report that was prepared uh, by the special study. <clears throat> After that, he came back into the Division of Trading Markets, uh, where he was Associate Director and in charge of the regulatory side. He also served as General Counsel of the Special Counsel's Office at that time. In 1968, he left to become Vice President and Treasurer of the World Bank, uh, where he also had one of the most successful careers. And since we're discussing securities, he ran a $8 billion trading fund at the World Bank, which included, as I understand, the pension monies for the World Bank employees. And it was probably the most successful trading operation of any government or quasi-government institution. He kept leaving the World Bank. He went on to be a executive vice president at Merrill Lynch, and he now serves on boards around the world. So he hasn't retired either. Lastly, but not least, is Judge Stanley Sporkin. Stanley Sporkin uh, went to work at the special study at, uh, as an initial employee of the commission and uh, was in charge of the financial responsibility part of the report that ensued thereafter. Uh, he then came to the Division of Trading and Markets, uh, where he was in charge of enforcement for many years. And uh, the last seven years, he was the director of the enforcement division. So after a 20-year stint at the commission, he went on to become general counsel of the CIA and thereafter was appointed a judge of the United States District Court here in the District of Columbia, where he served until 1999. He had a fabulous record as a judge, established a degree of uh, court ingenuity 
that is rarely seen uh, by a jurist and established an outstanding reputation for his judicial services. He is now with a private law firm, Wyeth, Gottschall, and Mangies. Uh, the rest of the panel will be introduced by my brilliant co-moderator here, Brandon Beck. Uh, yeah, uh, from your lips. Uh, to my far right is uh, Bob Birnbaum, who uh, served at the commission from 1961 to 1967. Uh, his area of expertise, uh, prophetically, was the study of regional exchange markets and stock markets while at the uh, study. After leaving the commission, he served at the American Stock Exchange from 1967 to 1985, serving as president of the exchange from 1977 to 1985. And then in one of the remarkable uh, feats, uh, he crossed the graveyard and served as president of the New York Stock Exchange from 1985 to 1988, uh, and then served as counsel, uh, special counsel to Deckard from 88 to 93, assisting uh, the exchange in dealing with a wide range of enforcement and disciplinary related matters. Uh, Bob has been a, a wise counsel uh, throughout uh, exchange regulation and has helped many of us in understanding how markets work and keeping the commission uh, focused uh, over the years. Uh, to Bob's left and my right is Norm Poser, who served in the area of financial uh, public relations for the special study and publication of financial information. He began at the SEC in 1961 in the Division of Trading and Exchanges, where he was assistant director of that division after his work on the special study. He left the commission in 68 to join the American Stock Exchange until 1980 when he became a professor at the Brooklyn Law School where he continues to teach today. Uh, all you need do is punch up in Lexis uh, any of his groundbreaking articles and you can look at the last decade of market reform at the commission uh, and you've, you've read any of Professor Poser's articles, you uh, can anticipate where those reform efforts went next. Uh, his treatises on broker-dealer regulation and international securities regulation continue to help those of us who try and figure out what the rules might be. Uh, to my right, to Irv's right, is Fred Cecil, whose area of expertise in the special study was in economic analysis. After the conclusion of the special study, he served in the Division of Trading and Markets at the SEC until 1969. Uh, he worked at Whedon and Company from 1970 through 1978 and then performing a feat almost as amazing as going from the American Stock Exchange to the New York Stock Exchange. He went from Whedon and Co. to the New York Stock Exchange in 1979 uh, where he recently retired this summer and led a distinguished career there uh, in helping them assess uh, market operations. To my left and to Stanley's left is David Silver. Uh, who focused on the New York Stock Exchange, its specialists, its floor traders, its odd lot dealers, and commission rates uh, during the special study. Uh, he began his work at the commission in 1960 in the Trading and Markets Division and worked in the Division of Market Regulation after the conclusion of the study. Many of you will know David as president of the Investment Company Institute from 1977 to 1991 and president of the ICI Mutual Insurance Company from 87 to 2000. Uh, certainly the enthusiasm and leadership he brought to the mutual fund industry uh, as it grew over the last two decades is part of the reason why the oversight mechanisms for that industry uh, has caused it to be the source where America's retirement funds are located. Uh, and to my far left is Mike Eisenberg, who was uh, liaison from the then Division of Corporation Finance, continuing to the special study and continues as a member of the staff of the commission. And we think, we think, is the only member of the current commission who worked on the special study uh, who currently serves on the commission. Uh, and this distinguished uh, panel, we hope, uh, will give you some perspective and some encouragement uh, that it was hard in the past, uh, and it's hard now, and it will be hard in the future, but it's worth doing. <coughs> Uh, we're going to start first with uh, the subject of why was there a special study? And there's no one better to answer that than our dear friend Milton Cohn. Milton, could you tell us what the factors were which led to the special study?
crushed in Blunder Ford. And there had been a scandal at the American Stock Exchange involving the firm of Re and Re. And those were the principal things, I think, that Congress had in mind when they decided that there should be a look at the total industry. And they gave that job to the commission to carry out, and they gave the commission a very broad mandate, and the commission proceeded in 1961 through a staff of which I had the privilege of being the, the director, and the uh, The commission felt that it could leave the, the work to the staff and only go over general ideas, which the staff kept reporting to the commission what they were up to, what they planned to do, and the commission would consider it and they never controlled what the staff was going to do but they always were aware and and approving of what the staff was going to do when the whole thing was over he submitted a report it was called a report of the staff of special study to the commission and this was put forth in this great uh, uh, volumes that you've been told about, but the, there were two sources of objection to it. One was the Congress. The minute they saw the study coming from the staff, they sent word back that they wanted a report from the commission and not from the staff. So the, the commission had to go through what we had done what they were familiar with in general, and uh, the other big thing that happened was that after the report came out, a professor of economics at the University of Chicago, where there was a great source of market is anti-regulation and pro-market control of the markets. And this was the only really critical study of the work we had done. It was really a, a very strong, strongly worded indictment of everything we did. And what really got me going at still makes me angry <laughs> is that as he went through the thing he never called it anything but the Cohen report <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> so I guess that explains best I can the answer to your question what motivated you when undertaking this Herculean task Well, back in Chicago, where I was practicing law after having left the commission, after the uh, uh, Public Utility Holding Company Act was pretty far along, Bill Carey was a professor at Northwestern Law School and a friend of mine, and we just bumped into each other sort of by accident, I think. And it turned out he was looking for somebody to head up the special study. And he remembered that I had done this work on the Public Utility Holding Company Act. So he said, would you, would you take it over? And I said, yes. <laughs> and uh, that was how I got to be chairman of director. Uh, Ralph, you were responsible and helping to staff this uh, group of people. 
I think it would be helpful if you could uh, give us a resume of how you went about choosing the people to do the study and perhaps how you organized the various projects uh, that the uh, talented people were assigned to perform. I heard I'd say the putting together this wonderful team was ad hoc. Uh, uh, Milton and I on the way down, Milton and I on the way down were trying to recollect about how, how some of the, these people came to the study. And actually, uh, uh, some uh, uh, were recommended by Bill Carey. I think Bill, Bill had a number of people. Dick Paul, who was one of those who unfortunately uh, died recently, uh, was the general counsel. Uh, uh, there were many others that came from the commission staff, uh, Gene and uh, Fred Moss, uh, Bob, Bob Birnbaum, Norm. So there were quite a number in the Division of Trading and Markets at the time who came on over. And then I think some from Corp Finn. Then there were others, what was very interesting, I think there were others that were recommended by staff people. Uh, in fact, our good friend, uh, Judge Sporkin, I think, came from some rec I don't know who recommended. Uh, I've got to find that out. Uh, but you were, as I recall, Stan, you were with a law firm here in town. Weren't you specializing, I think I'm going to show, I'm going to test my memory, specializing in FCC law. How do you like that? Anyway, I don't know who recommended you, but anyway, I remember when we interviewed Stan and I hired him immediately. Uh, what was that? We're still looking for the guy who recommended <laughs> <laughs> uh, But I would say in answer to your question, uh, Herb, it was ad hoc, uh, but we signaled out, uh, we tried to signal out very talented people, and I can just look at the group that you have here. Uh, in terms of the, your second question, organizing the study, uh, you know, I made a contribution, but it was Milton Cohen who organized the study. I mean, Milton brought this tremendous brain power to seeing uh, what the, uh, how the study should be, what it should focus on, uh, how it should be organized, and uh, I got into the task of helping uh, decide who was going to serve, who was going to do what part of the study. Uh, but I think uh, the organization, the intellectual organization of the study was Milton Cohen. I mean, I did the, you know, the administrative part, uh, hopefully, you know, getting the right people, and I think we did get the right people, and we assigned them to the right tasks. And uh, uh, basically, that's it. Could I ask David to talk a little bit more before we turn to the substance about how did the interaction work with the staff of the commission? To what extent was there an interplay between the study itself, the staff of the commission? How did you maintain those relationships going forward? I think the, uh, the relationship was uh, a, a good one, a very, very good one. It was, a, I think, a pervasive sense at the commission. Uh, by the commission of the commission itself and the staff that the world, the world, was ready for a special study. And so I think that uh, uh, there was a widespread view among the commission staff of essentially more power to them. And uh, we received, I think, uh, help uh, from every one of the actors divisions at the time. I might say one thing. Uh, Milton mentioned the Ray and Ray case and the American Stock Exchange investigation as the predicate for the prequel of the type of study, if you will. That certainly uh, provided the publicity steam engine. Which uh, uh, fueled the legislation uh, which uh, led to the special study. However, uh, it not only revealed that the Commission had lost touch with the markets as such, but there was also a sense that the Commission, and I think this has been somewhat lost in history because of the Ray and Ray case and the Amex investigation, that the Commission had lost touch with an awful lot of what went on in the securities world. I have a memorandum, I have a document, 
Uh, written, I have a list. <laughs> written by Barney Woodside, of course, who was a towering figure uh, at the SEC, uh, to Bill Carey, giving his ideas of what the special study uh, should do. And uh, I'd just like to quote one, one passage. Uh, he says, the world and the Congress assume that we are the experts on all aspects of the securities business, including the distribution of securities. C, that's his next letter, C, anyone making the assumption referred to in B as to our expertness as an organization or even our knowledgeability on the subject of the process of distributing securities is indulging in serious error, and we better be the first to realize it. Such knowledge on the general subject now in the possession of staff members is fragmentary, unassembled, and generally unavailable as a basis for decision making. So Barney brought the other half of the Commission's work into the ken of the, of the special study. Can I just turn it to Gene then and say, if we've got hot issues, Ray and Ray, the market break of May 1962, how do you go about deciding how you allocate your resources? What issues do you decide? How, how do you actually then come up with the list of what you're going to pay attention to? You've got such a smorgasbord in front of you. Yeah, well, well first, before I answer that, uh, let me uh, make a comment which I hope uh, is accurate, which I know will be somewhat uh, controversial, which is what I do all the time, I'm afraid, um, on the relationship issue. I think that Dave and Ralph are right that the relationship between the special study and the staff was excellent. The relationship between the special study and the commission itself was testing. Uh, because as Milton has indicated, at some point the commission had to say yes or no with respect to every recommendation. That we realized was beginning to affect what was written and what was not written. I think it's fair to say that most of the staff at the Commission at that time had, for want of a better term, a healthy cynicism toward the Commission itself in the sense that, look, we don't know what's going on in the markets, you don't know, we are not political. And a lot of that, obviously, uh, took place during and certainly after the special study, particularly when it came to a lot of controversial issues where I can tell you a half a dozen cases where the staff was working as if there were two independent regulatory agencies in the building. One was the Securities and Exchange Commission. The other independent regulatory agency was the Division of Trading and Markets. Um, That's still the case. <laughs> <laughs> uh, having said that, um, and you saw the staff during the study and after the study uh, working with Justice Department, regional stock exchanges, parts of the securities industry, the third market, uh, to implement things in the marketplace or in the legal system outside of the Commission's regulatory authority because of a bit of unease whether the Commission itself as an entity would be able to act. Um, I think, fortunately, I know that has changed. In answer to your question, Victor, um, it was pretty much the truth uh, he had that it was ad hoc. Uh, that is, Dave knew about what was going on with respect to odd lot dealers, specialists, and floor traders. Uh, there was another group which said, look, stock prices come out on new issues. I don't think the term IPO was known at the time. 
at four dollars the next day is eight how come and that doesn't happen of course anymore <laughs> um, someone would say you know you got all these commissions that are uh, being uh, distributed to the securities industry but it has nothing to do with execution of orders and they're not going for the benefit of stockholders uh, from the mutual funds it's funny because the firm who's doing all the work isn't getting paid for it and unfortunately uh, that issue I understand has also been solved <laughs> um, so that there were perhaps a half a dozen major structural issues dealing with how the market worked uh, which just took off 90 percent of the attention and it just went straight through the study they were known ahead of time uh, the, I don't think there were many issues which came up during the study except for the market uh, except for the market break itself um, and essentially it was staffed as you know by lawyers and Dave just pointed out to me walking over here that there is an enormous body of factual information very little policy in the text that is this is what people do for a living this is why they do it this is their rate of return this is these are the motivations these are the conflicts these are not conflicts this is why a given person does what he does this is how it's financed it was just this huge body of information my own personal view is that the great quality of the study is not the regulation or the laws which came or didn't come out of it but rather this accumulation of simply how the securities markets work uh, that quickly became available to everybody on the staff and to the commission and it, in a sense I think created a mutual respect between the securities industry and the staff of the commission because they finally said hey these men and women know what we do for a living uh, on the issue of uh, the structure of securities markets uh, which had not previously really been explored uh, uh, I, I agree completely with what Jean said about the the fact-finding role of the special study and I think that was its great contribution I think if you divide the role of the study into two parts one being uh, what Jean described the, uh, the accomplishments of putting out in, in a massive report information with, with about the uh, securities markets that's one part of it the other part is uh, the normative part, the recommendations uh, that were made. And I think in, in that part of it, I think we, it's very difficult today to cast ourselves back 40 years. I think that it, uh, it was a very conservative time. And I think the special study was very conservative. Uh, it, it was, you might say, pragmatic. I think the, the, it, it attempted to do certain things that could be done. It did not make recommendations that really involved changes in the structure of the markets to any, to any major extent. There were some. Uh, I think that what happened was that this body of information that the study produced had a long-term effect. And I think that it was after the uh, back office debacle uh, of 1969 to 1970 that Congress got really interested in the structure of the securities markets. And I think when you look at the, the 1964 amendments, the main thing there, there were, there were several things, but the main thing was over-the-counter disclosure, disclosure by over-the-counter issuers. That had been in the works, had been, had been kicking around for many years before the special study. The special study got it done. But as to uh, other things, uh, the, the role of the SEC vis-a-vis -vis the self-regulatory organizations, 
for example, it was not until the 1975 amendments, uh, which followed uh, two congressional studies uh, of the markets, that reforms that were necessary were made. I, I don't mean to minimize the role of the special study because I think that the, uh, the work that the special study did to some extent laid the groundwork uh, for the early the 70s when Congress and the, maybe the markets were ready for it. It was not till 1975, uh, 12 years after the study came out, that uh, commission rates became uh, negotiated. Uh, however, the work that the study did in putting out on paper the, the, what was really going on with commissions led to uh, another study, which I think Gene was very much instrumental in, in the middle to late 60s. So the study really got a lot of things going, but it took a long time before they were finally, or I, wouldn't, I shouldn't say finally, but until they were really put into effect. I, uh, I'm not sure, I think Ralph and Milton would know a lot better than I would, but I don't uh, recall, as Gene mentioned, the tension with the commission, because as I recall it, it wasn't until Milton and Bill Carey went up to Congress to present the special study that Congress at that said, we are not accepting the study, uh, Commission uh, Chairman Carey and Mr. Cohn, because we want to know where the commission stands on every recommendation. It wasn't until that day that the commission itself found out that they're going to have to have a position on all of these recommendations. So I don't think, I didn't see in myself anyway, but of course I was solo down the totem pole, I would have, wouldn't have known, but I didn't sense there was any uh, tension with the commission itself. I think they were very supportive, and certainly Bill Carey and Art Fleischer, who we used to have a lot of battles with, were certainly involved all the time. Uh, so I didn't see that, I mean, as, uh, as Gene pointed out. Yeah, I think, I think we would ask Milton yeah, and Milton. Ralph, who are in the better position uh, to uh, explain that, and before I let them speak, I might say that the... 1968-69 uh, back office crisis was predicted by the special study. If you read the special study, they said that unless something was done for the clearing and settlement process, we were going to face that tobacco, and they proved correct because I had to deal with it, and I regretted that I hadn't paid more attention <laughs> to the special study. But let me ask Milton and Ralph, <clears throat> and might I ask when you address this, one of the questions that is posed is, was it an advantage that you at least were not directly within the commission as a special study, rather than having been a operating section of the commission itself? I think it was an advantage to be outside of the operating work of the um, of the division because the old problem of seeing the forest or the trees. People working closely with some of these questions just never were able to perceive how they all fit together. And it took something like the special study to relate a lot of things that had been happening but people hadn't paid attention to and some things that were in the process of happening. We were, I think, the first to spell out at the commission level some three things that have since dominated the market scene but which really weren't perceived or paid attention to until after the special study. And those were institutionalization, globalization, and um, automation. Those things were just coming into the, uh, into the field and nobody was paying any attention to them. I remember visiting the New York Stock Exchange 
and we were beginning to talk about automation. And I talked to Keith Funston, who was the, then the head of the stock exchange, and I said, Mr. Funston, have you done anything about automation? And he said, of course we have. I'll show you what we've done. So he took me to a room, and on the wall of the little room were a bunch of phones, telephones, hanging on the wall. And you could pick up the telephone and ask for a quotation for a particular stock, and the telephone would answer you. And he said, you see how we have progressed with automation. <laughs> <laughs> and this was just symptomatic of the fact that automation was there. The special study didn't produce it. The special study merely recognized its importance and pointed out the need for it to be taken into account in the work of the commission and by the industry. And the same is true of globalization and, and uh, institutionalization. The institutional market at the time of the special study was just beginning to appear as an important component of market. Most orders were individual orders, and the prices were fixed by individuals trading, and no Nobody was noticing the fact that these great institutions were beginning to dominate the market. I mean the pension funds and the um, mutual funds. And again, we didn't create the forces of those factors, but we did talk about them and awakened awareness to their importance. Ralph, would you could say I, could something? I add, could I add one thing, Irv, sure. to what uh, Milton said? I think, uh, too, there was another thing that was incipient at the time of the study, and that is the coming of the idea of deregulation of the markets and the relying upon you know, the markets themselves for regulation. I think that whole movement was just was beginning to start and of course blossomed in the 70s and of course came to full flower in the 80s. Uh, I would think that was another, uh, would you agree with that, Milton? No, that was another factor that uh, uh, was not on the scene, that, that was not on the scene in the early 1960s, the whole concept of, of deregulation is using that as a, and using the market as a tool to control behavior. I don't think I would quite agree with you, Ralph. I think that, on the whole, we in the special study believed in regulation and not the power of the markets. The study was dominated by, we had some good economists, but it was dominated by lawyers who thought in terms of legal norms. And we, I don't think, paid enough attention to the emerging importance of the market itself as uh, determining how things were going to happen. I disagree. Well, I, no, all, I, no, all I'm saying though, is that the concept of deregulation had not arrived on the scene when we were doing the study. That's right. And we would have had to deal with it. That's all. I'm not disagreeing with you on, you know, I mean, obviously, uh, the, the study was, was a regulatory study. And I think most of us around this table believed in some kind of reasonable regulation of it. Uh, let me just follow up, if I may. I understand the reluctance of the commission to ad hoc approve all of the recommendations that the special study was coming forward to. But what I would like to address is the relationship between the special study and the commission with respect to the inquiries that you were making during the special study. Was there influence by the commission which at all debilitated your ability to carry forward your study? I don't think so at all. 
we do, as I said before, keep the commission informed of what we were doing. And of course, they had opportunity to make suggestions or criticisms. And to that extent, they might have influenced our future uh, conduct of the study. But there was not at any time a tension between the commission and the staff. I think our, our inquiries were not at all limited by the commission. The disagreements, the extent that there were disagreements, came with recommendations, but it was nothing but unstinting support for the inquiry itself. As a matter of fact, when we ran out of money at one point, uh, I discovered that the Census Bureau had something called computers, and that would be very helpful to do a trading study of New York Stock Exchange specialists. Uh, Milton and Ralph went to the commission, and Bill Carey gave us $17,000 uh, to pay the Census Bureau to do the study uh, without any uh, reservation at all. Also, the special study staff learned, I think what every generation of staff members learned, that probably the most effective way of communicating with the commission is not to send a memoranda, but a judicious call to a New York Times reporter <laughs> or a Wall Street <laughs> Journal reporter <laughs> will get the commission's attention very quickly. Dave was the uh, You know, I might, I might say, I've got, I've got one thing to add to that. Uh, Dave, Dave taught me the fine art of leaking. <laughs> that, that's because he liked that woman reporter on the New York Times. <laughs> First Brett, and then Michael, and then we'll have to take a recess. But as, as, as Chairman Kitt and others were, um, uh, mentioned, the, I think the biggest impact of the study was the was on the Commission itself, with, especially with respect to market structure. And it was just at a time when you, you, the institutionalization of the market was starting. You had block trading starting, and uh, and and you also had that tension between the growth of block trading and institutional trading and the, the fixed commission rate structure on the exchanges where uh, it was based on 100 shares and the rate was 10, 10 times for 1,000 shares what it was for 100 shares. And that led to uh, all sorts of give-up prices and practices of reciprocal practices which Gene had conducted hearings on in the, uh, in the late 60s. And, so, and, this, and the end point of that was really in the 1975 Act amendments with the, uh, with the fixing of rates. The, um, and, and that was the context in which it was almost perfect timing in one sense that the study came out at that time just as these changes in the market and the market structure were, were beginning to take place because they had a direct bearing and impact on that structure. Um, with respect, uh, Ralph referred to deregulation and to uh, um, the, the study itself didn't well, it made, made a recommendation on commission rate that there be a volume discount established and uh, to to, to change the pattern, but the, the, the danger was that the study was due, that the commission would be getting into the business of rate regulation, which it really hadn't been in before. And I think what uh, one of the footnotes I want to add was in there was a member of the special study. If you look in the transmittal letter, you won't find his name as a member of the special study, but that was a bit of subterfuge, and that was Walter Werner, and he joined the study sometime in, uh, in the first third or so of, of 1962. And he was listed as associate director of corporation finance, but Walter was really on the on the uh, on on the key member of the special study. And after the uh, after the study was over, he became uh, director of policy planning, and uh, Chairman Carey quickly changed that to policy research. And uh, and Walter was the first person to propose and suggest that commission rates be unfixed, and uh, and that was sort of the deregulation move that uh, that started. I think there were as many people stunned by that idea within the commission as there were outside the commission. And uh, and I just wanted to uh, make that part of the record that he was the he was the source of that idea within the commission. So. Uh, Ralph and I, when we were at the commission, we thought Walter had a terrific idea about uh, get, uh, unfixing the rates. But somehow, when we went to the American Stock Exchange, Ralph and I had a complete change of heart. <laughs> I, I, just, I just want a couple of things. Uh, one is that 
uh, not being part of the uh, commission, being a uh, sort of insulated from the commission, the study had a freedom to explore things, uh, and the junior staff of the, uh, of the study did explore those issues, and I think it was pretty clear that uh, uh, members of the uh, staff had certain interests that they were going to pursue. I mean, nothing was going to stop Dave Silver from exploring what was going on with floor trading, or, and a lot of that had to do with what they learned from the Ray and Ray case, which was really a very significant event, even though a lot of people here don't know what Ray and Ray uh, was about. But it showed there was real trouble, and it wasn't in Denmark. It was downtown, and it had to be looked at. I think with respect to the, uh, uh, to the fix, uh, unfixing the rates, I think early on, very early on, once we learned that Whedon was around and that there was a third market and that the third market was doing trades at, uh, at significant uh, discounts and blocks, and the question of, well, what happened to the rest of the money came up that uh, that was pursued. And the fact that May Day 1975 was on fixing of the rates, the phase-in started a lot earlier. And I think it's fair to say that one of the objectives of the uh, staff of the study was we wouldn't get rates unfixed. And it wasn't going to be done necessarily by the end of the study. But when uh, uh, Gene and I and others did the uh, commission rate hearings, which were right after the study, that was just a continuation of what we were doing in the, uh, in the special study. When you talked about what the mutual funds were doing in Chapter 11 and give-ups and how give-ups were uh, being uh, sloshed around, the people in the exchange who were supporting uh, the fixed rates of commission, which, uh, which enabled the give-ups to, uh, to, uh, to be circulated, was, and we were in effect saying, well, you know, let the market do this. And they're saying, you're a bunch of communists. What we need is the government to support us in the fixed commission rates. And that got us to antitrust in the Kaplan case and what the commission's role was with respect to antitrust, which was a centerpiece of, uh, of the commission rate hearings after. So the history of the commission is sort of a continuum uh, that the special study was the starting place you got the facts. I mean, we actually went to Wall Street, spent weeks at firms finding out what it was they did. And we, at the end, in the study, knew more about what was going on than the regular staff of the commission, and that was transmitted. I mean, we would meet with Barney Woodside and with Manny Cohen. By the way, Manny Cohen thought calling it the Cohen study was a terrific idea. Uh, <laughs> uh, and they would, he'd, they'd say, and we'd sit around with them and say, well, what did you learn when you went up there? And in addition to telling war stories, they really were interested in knowing how was it that the market works, and that energized uh, the commission. I think tribute goes both to uh, Chairman Kerry and to uh, Chairman Cohen, uh, who were ins instrumental uh, in moving it along. And I don't think it was a conservative uh, a group in the special study at all. Don't forget, this was the beginning of the Kennedy administration. There was still uh, the idea that service in government was a good thing, that the denigration of the, uh, of the civil service and of the people who worked for government didn't come until much later in the Reagan administration, and that serving at the commission and serving on the special study was an honor and was a great thing to do. And uh, that spirit carried through the special study uh, basically under Milt's, uh, uh, Milt's leadership. And I think that spirit and that feeling had a lot to do with why 90% of the special study people turned up at the 25th reunion. I mean, there was uh, this free the core there that uh, was, uh, was hard to duplicate. Stan, yeah, one, one, just one more, and then we'll yeah. try and break. Yeah, let me tell you what it was like. Uh, what it was really like. <laughs> As, as a young person working here, uh, Milton Cohen was a tough taskmaster. He uh, would make uh, Marty Schottenheimer look like a uh, puppy dog. <laughs> he insisted. He was a lot more. He was a lot more successful than yeah, Schottenheimer. Know, you had this. This is something that the, the staff, I think, would find helpful. If you came with something, you had to prove every single word. Everything had to be. Footnoted. You had to show him. He, he insisted that the integrity of that report 
was the most important aspect of it. Everything had to be fully, fully uh, uh, proven. Uh, uh, it, it, it was, and we worked hours beyond belief. I, you know, nobody has said that before. They, no, no short of the 12-hour day, 7, 7, 12, I guess. Uh, uh, everything fully documented, everything specific. Uh, it was extremely well written, and uh, Ralph uh, made sure that everything was coordinated so that even though you had different people who were writing different parts of it, and that they had a, there was a lot of overlap there, that had to be wrung out so that this, uh, this paper uh, made the sense it did. And I would say to you that if you didn't have those latter ingredients, if you didn't have the fact that of it being well written, if you didn't have the fact that it was documented, I don't think Milton, anybody ever took you up on any of the facts of it, as I can recall. Uh, and, and if you didn't have that, you, the credibility of this report wouldn't be what it is. And I think that's important. And you're right, Mike, the spirit was because even though we work like dogs, and even though we, we, we uh, uh, there were no, remember you canceled all vacations and everything. Uh, uh, even though we did all that, we did have a camaraderie. We did have a, a closeness that developed, and uh, and a lot of people stayed on uh, after the commission because they believed in. They wanted to see what was in there to be implemented. I'm no air conditioning. No air conditioning. I'm no air conditioning. You're right. Thanksgiving. Yeah. Milton yeah. gave us off at three o'clock so that we could go back to our families and have Thanksgiving dinner and come in the next morning. Well, on that happy note, <laughs> why don't we take a 10-minute break and then come back for the second hour? Right. Yeah.